Since 1934, Iowa's farmers have turned to the Iowa Farm Bureau spokesman as their trusted news source. Now, the spokesman speaks. Listen in and hear from leading experts on topics important to farmers and agriculture. Now, here's your host. Welcome to the July 27th edition of the Spokesman Speaks podcast. I'm Andrew Wheeler, and in today's episode, we're going to dive into the topic of water quality with Iowa Secretary of Agriculture Mike Nag and Mark Jackson, a Mahaska County Farm Bureau member who was recently named Iowa's 2020 Conservation Farmer of the Year. This is actually part one of a two-part series we're doing on conservation and water quality, with part two coming on August 10th. As Iowa Farm Bureau's public relations manager, I get the chance to see and share the progress Iowa's farmers are making. So I'm excited to bring you some good water quality news and opportunities to learn more about adding to the conservation practices on your farm. We'll start with Secretary Mike Nag. Spokesman editor Dirk Steimel caught up with Secretary Nag earlier this summer to discuss Iowa's current water quality progress and what's next. Mike, even with the pandemic and a tough economy, farmers continue to push forward on projects to improve water quality in Iowa. What do you think are the key signs of progress in water quality? Well, I tell you, this has been an area I'm very proud of our team and the the partners that work on water quality and soil health all across the, the state, because even in the midst of a crisis, we have been moving in the right direction. And, and even in a a situation where on-farm income has been declining over the last several years, we have been on a completely different trajectory when it comes to implementation of conservation practices and adoption of management practices on farms that are improving soil health and, and ultimately improving water quality. I'm so proud of that, even in some very challenging times, and, and uh, we're, we're headed in the right direction. And And even as we you know, where we're looking to uh, work remotely and, and, you know, looking to restrict access to public uh, offices, our teams were still able to go out. And uh, maybe it's the ultimate social distancing exercise, right, to go out and lay out a practice uh, out in the field uh, somewhere. But that work went on and continues to go. And, and we, uh, while it was also a, a great year for spring planting, it was also a very good year from a conservation construction standpoint. And so, uh, we really believe that we're headed in the right direction. And so what's the evidence of that? Well, ultimately, we we want to count practices. That's that's the best way that I know how to show and to give evidence that we're moving in the right direction because the nutrient reduction strategy tells us that each practice has a corresponding nutrient reduction. If it's cover crops, it's got a you know 30% reduction. If it's a wetland, it's got a you know, up to 90% reduction in nitrogen. You know, the, those are things that we know because the science tells us that. So we can go out and count practices. We can go out and know uh, that we've got well over a million acres of cover crops in the state of Iowa now and, and headed for 2 million uh, very quickly. And that's evidence that we're moving in the right direction and that we've got a whole lot of folks paying attention to water quality and soil health uh, at a pace and a rate and a level that we, uh, we've never seen before. Mike, we've seen a lot of progress in reducing the losses of phosphorus, which are down 22% since the 1980 to 1996 benchmark period established in the uh, Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy. Why is that a good signal as farmers pivot to concentrate more on reducing nitrogen losses? This is a great signal, and it's further evidence that the approach that we're taking with the nutrient reduction strategy is an effective approach, that it will ultimately yield the results that we want it to. And the reason I know that is because we've been working on phosphorus reduction. We've been working on soil erosion prevention for uh, for decades. And it shows that when you bring focus, when you bring people, when you bring resources, uh, and when you show the benefits of certain practices that you can see adoption and adoption at a at a significant scale and ultimately what you see is that impacting the water in a positive way and so the the fact that phosphorus loss is down 22% since the benchmark period is is huge and uh, we believe that if we can apply the same kind of focus energy boots on the ground resources that we can also see that type of change uh, when it comes to nitrogen, and they are different practices, and they are different approaches, and so it will require time, 
but I think it just goes to show that uh, our non-regulatory approach, our science-based approach, our practice-based approach uh, works, and uh, we just need to continue to focus on accelerating uh, the rate of adoption and bringing innovation uh, to this space as well. And so uh, I think it's just more evidence uh, that we're on the right track. Mike, acreage and cover crops, as you noted earlier, has grown quickly across Iowa. Why is that a good signal for water quality? And what do the cover crop gains say about farmers' interests in improving water quality? Cover crops are great, great practice. And uh, we think they've got applications that fit into uh, a variety of operations, right? And that's one of the things I'm really committed to is that uh, we want to have a suite of practices that will work on any particular farm, right? The, the things that work in Southwest Iowa are not necessarily the things that will work on a farm in Northeast Iowa. The things that will work on a livestock farm are not necessarily the same types of practices that will be of interest to a producer that uh, is just row crop. And we want to be able to bring a whole host, a whole menu of practices to the table that folks uh, can consider and Im- implement into their operations. Cover crops, a great example of that. And, and again, we're, we're seeing a significant increase before the strategy was finalized. We saw a few thousand acres of cover crops, state of Iowa, well over a million acres now headed for two. And, uh, and that's really happened in very short uh, order. And, and I think it, it comes down to, to just being able to continue to show the benefits of whether we're talking soil health, whether we're talking weed control, whether we're talking infiltration, whether we're talking about addressing compaction, or whether we're talking about providing a great feed source for livestock. This is a really versatile crop, and uh, what we're finding is uh, uh, we can do it very, very well. And yet, we've got a lot that we need to learn yet about how best to implement and and, and use cover crops. And and there's a ton of work going on, Iowa State and on farms all across this uh, this state. Really excited about uh, what happens next. How does your department plan to continue scaling up state programs to assist farmers' efforts to improve water quality? You know, we're really focused on attracting any partner into this work that we can. We love to leverage our state resources. And that leverage comes from, of course, uh, farmers putting skin in the game, significant skin in the game in terms of investing their dollars. Uh, We're also very aggressive in going out and seeking federal dollars. And uh, we also want to attract and and have had success attracting private sector and uh, even some nonprofits who also are interested in putting dollars into into this effort to work with landowners uh, to improve water quality. And so we're always, always anxious to uh, form a new partnership and looking at innovative ways to deliver practices. We have our traditional cost share uh, based approach to implementing conservation practices, and that works and it'll be the core of what we do. Uh, But we know that there's more. We are looking for market drivers. We're looking for innovative ways to finance. We're looking for partnerships that we can connect uh, downstream interests and upstream interests. You know, can we get cities to look upstream in their watersheds and and potentially have a a flood mitigation effect while we can achieve nutrient reduction? Those are just a few examples of really innovative partnerships that are happening. And we're going to continue to do uh, to do just that. We haven't learned the last thing that we're ever going to learn about implementing uh, conservation practices in the state. There's a lot of work that's going into scaling up. Mike, some critics of the Iowa nutrient reduction strategy are saying that progress is not going fast enough and that we should determine progress by solely testing water. Mm-hmm. What's your response to that criticism? Well, I think I think you have to you have to ignore a lot uh, of the progress that you see across the state. You have to ignore a lot of the evidence that I've just talked about uh, if you're going to make this claim. To the argument about are we going fast enough? I think I think we all want to go faster. I think we all want to see more of an impact. I, I think we're all we're all anxious to innovate and accelerate the adoption of practices. The good news is that's happening. You know, uh, one one that I like to use is it took us. 15 years to build 90 nitrate reducing wetlands in the state of Iowa. Uh, We've got 41 under development that will come into uh, uh, existence in the next couple of years. That's tremendous acceleration. And yet it's not even close to where we would like to be and know we want to be. But it's it's evidence that we're moving in the right direction. Cover crops, again, going from a few thousand acres to over a million acres headed for two. That is evidence that we're accelerating 
uh, our adoption of practices. And so uh, I'm, you know, you have to ignore all of that if you're going to claim that we're not making progress. And I think to the point we we know, and I'm a big believer in. Uh, you heard me talk about counting practices. That is the best way to know that we're making progress on the land, which ultimately will result in improvement in the water. You can't just test the water. We do test water. We test water all over the state. Uh, we've got more nitrate sensors in the state of Iowa than any other state. That's, uh, that's just fine with me because it tells us a lot about what's happening in those localized watersheds. But water testing also tells us an awful lot about the weather that we're having. And uh, we need to keep that in mind too. Really good data point, not the entire story. We must look at what's actually happening on the landscape across the state of Iowa to get the full picture of what's happening when it comes to conservation. Well, it's not going to happen overnight, but I think you've got to be really encouraged by the progress we're seeing. And it's clear that farmers are just getting started. Last year alone, more than 50,000 Iowans participated in field days and other educational events to learn about conservation and water quality opportunities. You can read all about that and more in a new water quality progress report released by Iowa State, the Department of Ag, and DNR. We've included the link to the report highlights, as well as the full 115-page report in the notes for the podcast episode, so you can click there to view it. Now, let's turn to Mark Jackson, who was just named Iowa's 2020 Conservation Farmer of the Year. We know that farmers like to learn from their peers, and Mark is certainly a wealth of knowledge on the topic of conservation. And he's enthusiastic to share his experience with other farmers. Dirk Steimel and I traveled out to Mark's Mahaska County Farm last week to discuss what's working for Mark and what advice he has for farmers who are looking to take the next step on their farms. Here's Dirk's interview with Mark Jackson. Mark, why is conserving soil and protecting water quality so important to you? Well, my family has a long legacy in this county. Uh, I'm fifth generation. I have a son farms with me. Michael's sixth generation. I have a brother. Um, to me, farming is about a legacy. Preserving land, sustainability is in, in that conversation, and I think making that land better for that next generation. Tell us about the conservation practices you've adopted on your farm. Well, I've built from the basics over the years. I started uh, no-tilling into soybean stubble, planting corn into soybean stubble back in the 80s. Trying that effort to try to reduce runoff. I have good level fields, but I also have a lot of fields that are rolling. So my mind's eye kind of took me in the direction to try to conserve soil and, and started putting in grassed waterways where there were none and uh, headlands that were grassed as well, buffers along streams, things like that. What do you see as the biggest advances in conservation practices during your career in farming? Well, the technologies that we have today are, are phenomenal. I mean, the ability to have uh, you know, swath control, so I'm not planting through a waterway, I'm not double planting on end rows, things like that where I can actually save dollars and cents right up front without having to, to worry about whether there will improve yields. It doesn't matter because I just reduce my expenses, which when we talk sustainability, economics is right there beside you know the environment and the social responsibilities that we all have. And as I've looked back on my history, my soil health has improved, the soil structure, my water infiltration, things like that. With added residue, I've increased my organic matter by using cereal rye, things like that as cover crops in the fall to create that green root zone, if you will, as long throughout the growing season as we can between our cash crops that we plant. How long have you been planting cover crops? We're working about the seventh or eighth year now. We started slow, but we quickly saw the advantage. We didn't have the yield drag scenario. We did add pop-up starter on our corn, so we can do a little green on green if the rye is a little shorter early in the spring. But I think uh, when you're nutrient banking and conserving soil, that is definitely a long-term uh, scenario. And I think uh, with the legacy scenario, you got the next generation coming. It's, it's an optimistic uh, view. It's an investment. It is a cost of doing business. So yes, you, it's a cultural mindset when you get into it. And I think it's a matter of how you want to look at it. Do you want it to succeed or not? And anyone, I would encourage anyone that hasn't tried cover crops to try it in a small way. Don't go too large, you know, 40 acres, if you will, whatever is comfortable, uh, that field size, and try it several years. Three to five years is my 
challenge to anyone that has not tried cover crops. And if you could do it on every acre every year, that's even better. But starting the corn stalks from last fall, planting beans in it next spring, that would be my scenario if you have a cereal rye. And let that cereal rye get some height to it, you know, waist high, three, four foot, if you could. You're creating organic matter, you're sequestering nutrients. Then through time, three to five years, then make that call. Are there other conservation practices that you hope to adopt in the future? Well, I think our gamut, as I go down through the list, I probably struggle to find things that I haven't done. I've never made a mistake in the world of conservation, but there's a lot of things I won't do again. But I think when you start with the basics, the waterways, the headlands, the, the grass buffers, you'll soon find that it will grow in your own management style and your own farming terrain and that sort of thing. So, Mark, what you're saying is every farm is different. So you have to work conservation practices into what works for your farm. Very much so. Yeah, every farm is different, and I think every management style on a different farm is going to approach those challenges differently. Are you seeing more farmers in your area and around the state adopting conservation practices such as cover crops? Yeah, yeah we're starting to see that conservation whether it's the no-till, whether farmers just do the no-till into bean stubble, it's a positive, it's a good direction. We see a lot more cereal rye, and I think you look at the numbers out there, we're, you know, in the last 10 years we've gone from virtually no cereal rye, or I shouldn't say cereal rye, I'm talking cover crops. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm, that's kind of my go-to just because experience. And we do add other scenarios, oats and barleys and radishes and turnips and things like that for different experimental under the cover crop guys. But Growth has been positive, and I'm watching my neighbors start to turn their head, slow down, back up, drive in the driveway, and ask questions. And I think that's where it starts, is farmer to farmer. What advice do you have for farmers who are looking for ways to increase their conservation practices? So I think conservation practices start small. Uh, talk to your neighbors, your friends. The learning curve is, is different for everyone, but a lot of times you can eliminate mistakes by talking to others. There's a lot of good educational wintertime groups. Uh, the virtual world is, is amazing right now where you can go online and, and pick up uh, people from all over Iowa, all over the country doing different uh, scenarios and see how they may adapt to you. If you have livestock, uh, such as cattle and, and grazing cows, that sort of thing, that actually is probably uh, or even a more positive, easier conversation for you to have, but then you're starting to double crop, if you will, when it, using utilizing rye. And we've worked legislative with the, uh, you know, your uh, crop insurance individuals now, so that we can actually understand the double cropping scenario if it's if it's done properly. Lots of good advice there from Mark. As he said, conservation education often starts with farmer to farmer interaction which is why field days and virtual events that connect farmers have proven to be so popular. If you'd like to learn more about upcoming in-person and online conservation field days, we keep a running list of those events on conservationcountsiowa.com. You can find a link to that events listing in the notes for this podcast episode. Another useful resource is the new Conservation Practices Manual developed collaboratively by Iowa State, USDA, and other leading scientists and technical specialists. We talked with Iowa State's cover crops expert about that new manual back in episode 37, so you can go back and listen to that episode. It's linked in the notes for this episode, so you can find it there. And one more thing before you go. We know that conservation is just one of many topics that are on your mind right now, so we've got some great learning opportunities on other topics coming your way in the weeks to come. On July 30th, we have a webinar that's going to help you do a mid-year review of your farm's financial situation. On August 12th, we have a webinar to refresh you on DOT's rules for farmers as we head into harvest season. And on August 25th, we kick off a two-part webinar series on selling directly to consumers by building your own farm-to-table brand. You can learn more about each of those upcoming webinars and register for them at iowafarmbureau.com slash events. That's all for this episode of the Spokesman Speaks podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, I encourage you to make sure you're subscribed to the Spokesman Speaks in your favorite podcast app and join us for our next regularly scheduled episode on August 10th, which will be the second part of this two-part series on conservation and water quality. Until next time, I hope that every day presents you with an opportunity to learn something new 
and share your farm's unique story. Thanks for reading The Spokesman, and thanks for listening to The Spokesman Speaks. Thank you for listening to The Spokesman Speaks, a podcast by Iowa Farm Bureau. Check out more podcasts and articles from The Spokesman at iowafarmbureau.com slash spokesman. You can also find and subscribe to The Spokesman Speaks podcast in the Apple Podcasts app, Google Play, and other popular podcast apps. We appreciate your ratings and reviews and welcome your feedback at podcast at ifbf.org.